Hi, and welcome to Nokia Core Roundtable Discussion. Today we're going to discuss innovation in the new world of core software as a service. I'm your host, Sharon McTurnan, Head of Core Campaigns at Nokia. We have a remarkable panel with us today that includes experts from both Omdia and Nokia. We plan to explore the importance of core SaaS. We will reveal some new research about the market trends. We will also dive into a demo and show how it all works. And finally, we'll talk some about what to expect next for core SaaS. To start, I'd like to introduce our experts from Nokia. Kari Lamaskari, core SaaS portfolio manager, and Peter Kurta, head of SaaS automation and R&D. And I'd also like to give a warm welcome to our guests from Omdia, Roberto Company, Principal Analyst, and Kami Mindler, Chief Analyst. Throughout the discussion, our chat is open for questions. Since we have a full schedule today, let's jump right in. Our first question goes to Kari. Can you tell us what industry trends and opportunities have led Nokia to begin offering core software as a service? So why core SaaS? Well, there were actually two drivers for, for a, a starting to go into this direction. The first one was our own perception and our own Nokia vision of what's actually going to happen on the telco landscape in the next few years and what kind of a new use cases services would be required. So that was the starting point. The second were the signals uh, that we were receiving from our customers, both old and new, okay, on what kind of uh, new business they would like to build on top of the core and how they would like to use the core in the future. Now, these were still similar capabilities that, that we can today provide with our core, but the way the customers wanted to consume the core uh, was slightly different from the traditional telco, telco uh, needs. In, in these cases, the customer needs was more on a simplicity and ease of use of the core instead of a the customizability of the core. The need for the customer was more on having a core a, for a specific service or a need fulfilling a, a, a particular purpose instead of having something that would try to cater to every need. They were requiring a core for a supporting a kind of a transient type of use cases, which were more short-lived than your traditional core deployment, which you would first deploy on premise and then it would, uh, it would stay there for multiple years. And last but not least, they wanted to have more predictability on the costs of the core deployment, a, a, uh, including basically a, everything related to the core deployment itself, the maintenance, the care, the upgrades, the, the, a, a continuous running of the core and so on, more control over that. Now, many of those things we can basically support with our existing core portfolio already today. However, um, when we looked around, the core software as a service was the vehicle that we use in which we could optimize our delivery mm -hmm. and, and a, a catering for these particular needs. The core software as a service is extremely easy to deploy. It's fast to deploy. We can deploy it anywhere where there is basically a, a, a public cloud data center. It's something that we can set up on demand. We can set it up a, in a moment's need uh, to serve some kind of a transient uh, use case or need, and then we can tear it down after that if needed. And then we can repeat this as many times as required. It's something that's also operated and maintained by Nokia, including the whole security of the solution, including the upgrades of the solution, including the care operations of the solution. Everything is basically a, operated by Nokia, which makes it more simple for the customer to consume and focus on their business. Then the second thing that we needed to sort of, um, let's say, wait for before a, a creating this offering was the technology side of things. So uh, Core is very complex. It's, it's a very demanding set of applications to deploy and integrate together. Now, <clears throat> in order to basically make it happen. We needed to wait for the for the cloud native side of the applications to mature. We needed to wait for the public cloud providers to mature their platforms in order to be able to host our telco applications. And we needed to wait for the automation tooling to sort of catch up and allow for the kind of an automation that would now um, enable us to fully automate the delivery of the, the a, a software which is required in the course uh, in the software as a service type of a, type of an offering. So all of that 
basically considered, you could just say that the time was right for the offering. Basically, there was a customer need and there was basically a willingness from customer side to, to consume the core in a different way than before. And there was a technical readiness to create the offering. So that was basically why we, why we went to this direction. Great. Thank you for maybe, that. Maybe I would chip in a, a little bit and add uh, one more thing. Uh, you mentioned about the public cloud and uh, we have seen uh, a trend already uh, also with the CSPs, they more and more started using infrastructure as a service, as opposed to uh, own and and, uh, and operate all their infrastructures. And you know, once they start doing that, it is just one step further to put the application also there as a service, not only uh, the infrastructure. I think in the enterprise space, uh, it started much earlier, uh, but it started already in the tech space already, which is helping this transition. So, Kami, recently Omdia released a report on Core SaaS. Can you provide an overview of that study and uh, highlight some of the most important findings for us? Sure. Well, you know, if the core is the brains of the network, is so smart, is there wide awareness of this? Uh, particularly as the core becomes cloud native, the new ways of running the core in, in this public cloud environment. Is there awareness of this? What are the aspirations of different stakeholders and what actions are people taking? Now, the work that uh, Roberto Company and I conducted was actually quite wide ranging. And, and it was really important to us to speak to a number of different stakeholders. That I think there is often a perception that the core is just an operational discussion. It's just your network operations guys are going to be involved in it. But we wanted to speak to both demand and supply side stakeholders because we think that's really relevant and you'll see this in the study. So we spoke to internal CSP stakeholders who are in network operations and digital transformation. We also spoke to customer facing CSP stakeholders and a range of different CSPs, by the way, those are in product development, those that are in sales and marketing, targeting enterprise, targeting wholesale and corporate strategy. And not least, and this is what, uh, what I'm really happy about is we took a 360 degree view because we also spoke to enterprises, different enterprises in line of business, in a range of different industries, from logistics to energy to manufacturing. So we both surveyed enterprises and CSPs. We also ran an, a number of interviews. Roberto and I had a really good time speaking to tell um, people open the kimonos, one says, what they thought about core. Now, I'm not going to give it all away because we've got a lot to talk about, but let's, let's let me say the skinny right now, which is, Enterprises have a lot to teach CSPs about the cloud and how the core could be used in the cloud. You may not expect that. Um, and I'll tell you right now, as someone who's not a core expert originally, comes from the enterprise space, seems to me that core needs a makeover and actually should be viewed as a portfolio asset. Uh, um, and we've got lots of opportunities. And those that you view as end customers, like enterprises, um, they might be bigger than you might imagine in this space. I'll leave it there and um, hand over <laughs> to Roberto to get into the weeds. So, Roberto, can you tell us a little bit about the market dynamics and how they're going to change based on what you found in the study? Sure, yeah. Thanks, Sharon. So, um, just to go back and reemphasize a little bit what Camille was mentioning, you know, we need to remember what the core is. The core is the brain of the network and it manages a lot of the aspects relevant to the subscriber, including mobility management, routing of data, download speeds and charging. So, you know, in the traditional sense, network building um, operators would build their core on their premise, on their telco clouds using their own staff. And, you know, sometimes these uh, operations would be outsourced as sort of managed services. And so Omdia, we, we define core SaaS as a core network solution provided on a scalable public cloud infrastructure where the vendor is responsible for the operation and maintenance of the software, ensuring that the cloud-based infrastructure can deliver required network performance. And then of course, the customer pays for the service on a subscription-based or a consumption-based model. So, you know, uh, we're looking at 
the next phase of 5G deployments? What are the CSPs really doing? And now it, we're coming to the point where a lot of CSPs are starting to deploy the 5G core. Um, and this is very complex, as Kami mentioned. Um, it's, it's, it requires a lot of transformation changes in their organizations, bringing different teams together to work together. So in fact, this is actually one of the questions that we asked the survey respondents to answer. Uh, what were the CSP organizational priorities over the next 24 months? And 33% um, of the respondents said that it was to adopt a more efficient operating model. 29% said that it was to become a cloud native organization. And 27% said that it's to meet 5G deployment deadlines. So a lot of things that they have to do in short space of time. Um, there is a shift in the market. So, sorry, if there is a shift in the market uh, in terms of core SaaS, and that becomes a trend, it has the potential to become a sizable shift in how core network is required, acquired, operated, and maintained. Um, and we have to remember that, as we already discussed, core network is complex, and not all the operators or CSPs will be able to do this themselves, uh, to say nothing about some of the organizations Kami mentioned, such as enterprises. So again, this is a complex process. Not all entities can take benefit of this. So this is where we see Cora SaaS helping the market. Great information. Uh, let's move over to you, Peter. Uh, what technology is going to enable this software as a service? Right, right. Uh, it, some of the some of those uh, already mentioned uh, before by Cory and 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 Camille. Nevertheless, let's uh, let's run through on uh, uh, on a list of enablers uh, actually to to uh, create uh, uh, this uh, this uh, solution. Uh, and, and make it viable from technical perspective in, the, uh, in both in the enterprise and in the CFP space. So first of all, what has been mentioned already is the cloud native uh, nature of the core software. In the last few years uh, in Nokia, we have spent huge amount of effort to turn our software into a cloud native architecture, meaning making our software stateless, uh, making our software uh, microservice, uh, turning our uh, software architecture into a microservice-based uh, architecture, containerize our uh, software. So all these things uh, to to make it easily adoptable into into a cloud infrastructure, into a container infrastructure, and that enabled us to actually put our software into a public cloud infrastructure. The second is the public and hybrid cloud infrastructure that we can use or that one we are using to offer this service. So as opposed to build our own infrastructure to provide such a SaaS service, we are actually using uh, an infrastructure as a service from a third party and deploy our software into that on demand. So when somebody is ordering uh, the service from Nokia, then we are using a public cloud to deploy our application and using that public cloud infrastructure to provide the service. Now, this required actually adoption of our own software to the public cloud, because it's slightly different than uh, the environment that we are otherwise, otherwise using. And second, uh, also mentioned earlier, the public clouds are actually not designed for telco type of workloads. In the telco, we have very stringent requirements. Uh, you know, typically we talk about five nines, but even in the public cloud space, uh, even if it is not five nines, at least four nines that we that we definitely need to be able to provide. So we 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 needed to work together with the telco, uh, with the public cloud providers, so they can give us an environment where we can deploy uh, these heavy-weighted TACO applications and being able to provide a service which is at least four nights. So this, this requires this required development uh, from their side that they have done uh, in the last one and a half year. And, uh, and uh, together we have been uh, capable of, uh, of, of providing the right robustness and high availability uh, for the applications. 
The third R is the automation piece. Uh, we needed to make the whole deployment from the ordering process to the integration and delivery process acceptance uh, done in a fully automated way. It, it, it cannot work uh, any other way. A uh, normal uh, taco um, environment uh, delivery takes uh, several months uh, for many reasons, uh, yeah. but among others, uh, because this is, it is not fully uh, automated. Now here, uh, we had to automate from the, from the start, meaning that from the infrastructure deployment configuration to set up the cluster, to set up the environment, uh, the connectivity, uh, the VPNs, everything uh, in the infrastructure and, and between the public cloud side and the operator, and then deploy our applications, put there the configuration, integrate the individual applications and integrate our applications, freshly deployed applications to the radio or the other network elements on the operator side. So, so this was a huge work to automate all of this, needed a lot of uh, uh, innovativeness and, and, and a lot of invention uh, went into, into this area. All right, then uh, pre-engineered uh, uniform deployment and configurations. Uh, if you are looking at uh, any networks today, then they are somewhat unique. Every CSP is having their own requirement for the deployment configuration, for the configuration of the application itself, for the integration, uh, and so on and so on. Now, with the SaaS service, uh, this is not a scalable model. So we had to very carefully select the use cases that we want to offer in a SaaS manner and pre-engineer uh, pre it uh, to, the, to the last bit. For example, what kind of input parameters we need very precisely, very exactly to be able to properly deploy and integrate the freshly deployed configuration into the operator's network. So we want to provide this in a, in a uniform way, these services and, and, and by the pre-engineering, do all the design work in R&D time. So when it comes to the deployment and delivery time, then it is just, you know, a cookie cutter type of uh, exercise. And then last but not least, uh, we had to uh, preserve, I was talking a little bit about high availability robustness. Uh, we had to preserve this capability, you know, four nines uh, at least uh, uh, in the in the public cloud space. So we had to pay attention to this continuously. Uh, so maintain this career grade nature of the applications. Uh, partially, this is done by, of course, using the very same application that we are using in the normal deployment. So using all the high availability mechanisms of the uh, existing uh, core software, but also a little bit adopt those into the public cloud environment and to this uh, SaaS requirements. That's what I would say. Great, thank you so much. I think now is the perfect time to take a look at a demo. Uh, Kari, can you guide us through uh, a demo of course S? Yeah, sure thing. So, um, if I if I continue a bit on on the same track that Peter already started a really at the heart of everything when, when you talk about the SaaS is the automation. And if you want to really realize the benefits that you expect to get with the software as a service, then you need to basically have something which is fully automated. I, I do mean fully automated down to the last last day a, a part. So basically it needs to cover a, everything from the deployment to the configuration to, to the, a, a, even as much of the integration as possible. And um, it, it needs to be provided in a way that you don't need to be the world's foremost telco expert to actually make it happen. Now, if we go and see how this is actually done in a practice, we have a nice video clip that we can share here on, on how we actually do it on Nokia side. Everything starts from this kind of a catalog view. You have a view of a software as a service or services that you can pick from. For example, the 5G a SA mobile core. 
you click on that, you basically get the view of the high-level architecture you want to deploy, and then you simply select the software version that you want to go with. That's the start. That's how simply it starts. Now, of course, things are not that simple, <laughs> never are. And then you basically go into this kind of a wizard, which guides you through the whole deployment step by step. You start by selecting where you want your deployment to happen out of the available data centers globally. In this case, we selected Frankfurt, which is fine. Uh, then you select the traffic model that you want to serve. Effectively, this is the traffic profile. What kind of a traffic AA is going to be processed by the core you're creating? And again, basically, a, of course, all of these choices, especially the big ones that you make in the beginning here, have an impact on the price. You can see at the bottom right corner an example of this one, not the actual price. Um, after traffic model, you select the size of the deployment. We basically offer this kind of a T-shirt type of sizing. Um, you select uh, a high availability or SLO and redundancy model for your deployment, whether you want a single site or multiple sites. In this case, we're selecting a two-site deployment, a giving you some high availability, and you get prompted to select the second site for the deployment. In this case, I believe we're going for a, a site in Belgium, which is a quite close to the Frankfurt site where we're deploying our other core. And now you have two cores <clears throat> configured there, or let's say ready to be configured to provide the high availability. Next, you go into a bit more detail. You go into the configuration parameters. You select things like the name of your solution. You select a domain a, a for your solution and so forth. Now, if you would actually deploy a core manually on a public cloud, we would be talking of a executing a range of a, a uh, I don't know, excess of 3,000 manual steps at least. All of this we have automated to make it simple and abstract the whole a deployment scenario. Uh, in the configuration, you basically a, choose things like a, the PLMN, you choose basically a, a uh, your access point names, you choose or can basically introduce a uh, uh, the charging function, if you want, for integration and so on, you can a, create test subscribers already at this point, or you can import subscribers at the later phase and so forth. All of this is basically a, a uh, guided through the wizard. Finally, once you've configured your uh, core configuration, you basically can a, a also configure your connectivity, how you're actually going to connect the core that you're about to deploy into your own existing core deployment on your own premises, or not core deployment, but basically a, a network like radio or, or so on. Finally, you review, review your configuration and click on build. And this is where the magic happens. Everything is fully automated. It starts by basically a creating the virtual resources and the networking required in that virtual, in that cluster a, a for deploying those applications in a fully automated fashion. It reserves resources from the public cloud, it creates the networking, and then it goes on to deploy the management a functions and then a in a correct sequence, all the applications you require in your core that you just basically configured. Now, in, in of course, this is a very sped up version of what is happening in reality. In reality, a, through the automation, we can deploy the core in a few hours only, which is a, a significantly faster than if you compare it, for example, an on-premise project, which might start with the hardware ordering and, and could a, a, take a months, uh, months to complete and will usually take. Now, in the end, after deployment, you can view your configuration, you have information about your integration points, and, and then you can proceed with actually integrating what you just deployed with your own AA network on your own premises. And that's basically what we're doing here with the course of as a service. Thank you, Kari. At this point, we want to hear from the audience. So we've got a quick question for you, and we'd like your feedback. Um, will the course SaaS become an industry trend? If you, you believe that's a yes, please give us a thumbs up. If you believe that's a no, give us the hand clap signal. So the question again, will core SaaS become an industry trend? Thumbs up for yes and a hand clap signal for the no. Give you a couple seconds to answer that. We'd love to hear your response. Thanks so much. Now let's move on. We've got to talk a little bit about the future. And this is a question for the whole panel to discuss. Yeah. How do you believe the core SaaS offering will evolve? Um, 
For example, you have um, SA versus NSA. You guys go ahead, take it away. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll start if that's okay. Um, so, you know, in terms of trends, um, we already talked about that the next phase of operator deployment is to deploy the 5G core. So why are operators doing this? There's a number of reasons for this. One is that they want to become more like the hyperscalers. That's to make their networks more programmable. Um, two is to increase their network agility, efficiency, and scalability. And three is to deliver new revenue generating use cases. So they have to do this quickly. Um, otherwise they will miss their opportunity and they will not be first to the market or gain market share. Now, in order to understand how operators will solve these problems, the survey that we did, we asked the question in terms of the attractiveness of buying network functions as a service. And as we can see in the chart, 48% of these respondents said that they ranked launching new services faster as the most important. While 44% of the respondents said that the shift of work from manual tasks to more strategic tasks as the second most important. Now, interestingly, 47% of respondents ranked cost as the third most attractive reason to buy network functions as a service. So the survey results really indicate that CSPs are more concerned around launching new revenue generating services to compete in the market than with cost reduction measures. Yeah. Uh from my perspective, uh, when we discuss with customers, uh, what I see is that uh, various customer groups are excited uh, for Corsas for, for various reasons. So when we talk about uh, this topic uh, with CSPs, they first see it uh, as an opportunity for core network innovation, first and foremost. So they are those uh, engineering teams in the CSPs are let's say, struggling to having an environment, a uh, playground for their own to innovate new services or just getting tested. So they see it very attractive that, okay, now as a SaaS on demand, they can get that test bed as opposed to order something for their own in the laboratory, which takes a long time. It's, it's uh, generating a lot of CapEx investment. It's coming with a lot of set up time and so on and so on. So when they see that in a few hours, we can actually provide them a 5G core, a fully functioning 5G core that they can even integrate to their own radio in the laboratory use terminals, then it is very, very powerful uh, for them. So that's, uh, that's the CSP, uh, the big CSPs, um, established CSPs. Then uh, we see this kind of on-demand uh, CSPs who would need uh, an on-demand core for uh, for an event uh, or for a venue uh, type of uh, uh, for a festival, for example, when they need some extra capacity, these kind of things. So that's another uh, big use case uh, that we see. Then, uh, uh, of course, the enterprise space. Uh, so venue operators, hotel, uh, hospitality sector, we discussed with Roberto, Camille. Uh, who would be very much interested uh, to uh, to have uh, core MVNOs and VNEs uh, would be uh, very much love to to have their own core or at least part of a core uh, and uh, depend on a on a real CSP only for the for the radio. So just uh, from the top of my head, uh, these were the big uh, groups that I could I could recall. Gary, you probably have more in your mind. Well, I think you actually a, a stole my ideas for the most your services already, but that's quite fine. I mean, the priority from our point of view is this, of course, that we roll out or bring out this 5G SA core as a service. That's the basic building block on top of which or, or from which we can extend to cater to all of those a, a additional new, interesting, a demanding use cases like this peak, uh, let's say, core for the peak capacity or for disaster recovery core for event use, core for a, a dedicated core for enterprises, a, a for IoT, for a, the innovation lab use that was mentioned and so on. So there is a no shortage of, of new services that the customers are asking for, <laughs> certainly. But a, the, the 5TSA core as a service will basically be the baseline on top of which we can build all of those new things. 
and and uh, it will be a let's say interesting interesting to see how this day rolls out now. Yeah. Also, from the just looking at it from the R and D perspective, um, we have a, a, a huge roadmap pipeline uh, for the services that we would like to release. Uh, practically, some of those are more heavyweighted, uh, while some of those are more of a configuration uh, of, of various uh, features uh, of the of the core network, which may demand, for example, different dimensioning or different deployment configuration or different integration uh, to, the, to the customer's network. Nevertheless, uh, the point is that uh, I was talking about the, the uniform and pre-engineered uh, solution. So, so on one hand, we want to be very strict on that. On the other hand, we are looking uh, or we are planning to actually uh, release quite a few services uh, in the course of the, the next one, two years, I would say, for, for, for these various groups that we talked about. Great, that's a, a good segue into uh, the next question. Talk, I wanna talk a little bit about the new services and the value creation, as well as what are some of the use cases that are gonna come out of course SAS. Uh, Kami, Roberto, what do you guys uh, think about that? Yeah, um, Kami, maybe I'll start again first if that's okay. Um, so we already talked a little bit in terms of why CSPs are doing this to become more agile and deliver new services. And obviously cloud native architecture is the way that will facilitate this agility and bring new services. So Peter and Kari just mentioned the number of use cases, but the point really is that we want the network to be agile and programmable enough to be able to create on the spot, on the fly, automatically orchestrate new use cases that we can't even think of today. And you know some of these will have stringent latencies, um, whether it's uh, wide uh, bandwidth or small bandwidth, addressing a number of uh, IoT devices. So it could be anything, but the point is that the network has to be able to adjust itself and deliver that use case. So I have actually another uh, survey data, which I wanted to share with you here. And it's really to understand the benefits of cloud native technologies. So here in the chart, we can see that 43% uh, of the respondents said that it's important to be faster in responding to competitive activity, whereas 40% said that they want to improve customer service, and 36% said that new revenue streams. So this is a topic that we keep talking about, uh, delivering new revenues for, for the customers. Right, and uh, uh, let me just uh, draw out some uncomfortable truths, if I may. I mean, one of the reasons we spoke to enterprises was to highlight, is there a golden thread between this complex technical, this powerful technical environment and relatable business outcomes? And the good news is that enterprises are very interested, you know, they are beginning to buy into 5G because of a number of business outcomes that they believe in, such as you know, real-time decision-making, better operational efficiency, you know, new customer experiences. Those are some of the reasons that why they want to invest in 5G. But right now, there is an emergency in our market, and it is because service providers lack the operational agility to devolve and make available powerful 5G services beyond the very large enterprise. I mean, I would argue that today um, CSPs are addressing, you know, 1% perhaps of the enterprise universe because they don't have the agility to provide some of these services downstream. And, and I can tell you that the reason that enterprises are interested in 5G is because of greater reliability. There is a willingness from the SMB through to the multinational to pay more for better experience for better applications performance, um, for reliability. Sure, you know, new services and revenues are on the agenda as well. But a lot of it is about being predictably predictable and paying for that. And that is something that in many countries around the world, enterprises are not assured of. And so to me, job one is making 5G consumable on the fly to as many different types of enterprises as possible, and that's not being done. 
Um, and when when enterprises are investing in 5G, let me give you the priorities. And this is from, again, the work that we've done, which, by the way, you know, we speak literally to thousands of enterprises around the world. This is very consistent with other, other work. So in terms of what's budgeted to deploy in live now, the use cases that are driving 5G investment today in the enterprise is improving inspection processes to reduce production uh, defects, um, automating processes to fill, you know, human skills gaps, um, accessing real-time data to improve decision-making. All of that is sort of the top three. There's a lot more detail than that, which um, those of you that read our eBooks, our reports, will get the detail on this. But there are some very specific reasons why enterprises want to invest in 5G, but we need to make that a available to all and not just an a la carte service, but something that is, you know, bought, can be bought off the shelf. So besides CSPs, will other industries and enterprises subscribe to CoreSaaS? And what will it take to make this shift in the customer base? Well, it's already a very diverse customer base. Roberto and I spoke to a number of different stakeholders and different types of, of service providers. So, I mean, clearly one of the, the major groups, you know, the tier one operators, the global top 40 telcos that, you know, are long established, full service. And I suppose some of the objections, and Roberto, you have to, you should chime in as well. Some of the objections for them is, you know, the, there's no question about the cloud model. It's the degree to which they want to get into public cloud. I think that's one of the issues. Um, that might be holding them back. So that's one major group. But I'm really interested in some of these others that we've already hinted about, you know, the competitive operators who might be an MVNO that might be focused in the IoT space that is trying to do something like, you know, I don't know, uh, what well, it might be like truck as a service or something like that. You know, those competitive operators who might be focused on a particular customer, uh, customer group, they might be enterprise orientated or they might be regionally focused, only national um, operators. I mean, we have a market where we have hundreds of operators emerging. And we have now alternative service providers. We've mentioned a few, right? Um, we've talked about MVNEs, those mobile virtual network enablers. They're birthing new operators um, who may be focused on one particular application that a core as a service makes possible. Um, the private wireless players, the neutral host um, infrastructure owners. We have such a rich service provider environment. Oh, and by the way, the enterprises themselves becoming service providers too. The appetite is there. You know, enterprises seeking business model efficiencies, but also transformation. I've spoken to tra uh, to transportation companies, to manufacturing companies that see their roles, their business models evolving. They they are certainly more opex driven than they were. They might have an industrial or manufacturing focus, but they want to do more as a service. They, you know, they understand that their downstream customers and partners might want to be OPEX based too. And for those that are large enough and the propositions are evolving to go down the enterprise pyramid, core as SaaS is something that is consumable to an enterprise too. So, so it's a really diverse, rich customer landscape for core as SaaS, which I hope you'll agree with. <laughs> Thank you. So now let's uh, talk a little bit about what are the takeaways from this discussion? We've covered a lot of topics. What would we like the audience to remember and uh, take home from our discussion today? Peter, Kari? Kari, please start. Uh, we want oh. to be careful not to take your thunder again. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what I'd like people to to a, a take away from this one is, is to try and think a bit outside the box. I mean, the core as a software a offering that, that we're developing here is it's not there to replace your existing core today. Your on-premise core is still there to serve your a, a consumer base and so on. So that's not what the core software as a service is primarily for. It is basically there to complement your offering and to enable you to do a, a variety of interesting things. It basically a, allows you to easily expand the scope of your services a, to a try and launch new business without a very heavy upfront investment. Um, or a, a simply increase the speed at which you can launch these new services. 
and, and overall reduce the complexity that you would create by a, trying to introduce these a, new services into your existing core. So please think on those on, on when you think about how you could basically make use of the, the core software as a service. I think that's my, my takeaway. Yeah, very well said, uh, fully agreed, uh, of course. Uh, from my side, what I would put there is that uh, technology is ready uh, from the application side and also uh, from the uh, public cloud uh, EH uh, side. Uh, we have the technology to, together we have the technology to provide uh, um, a telco service as a, uh, as a service, uh, in an as a service manner. And last but not least, the automation that we need, that we have put in place, uh, that is uh, that is a major enabler, and that's what exactly we have done, and that's the big value here, which enabled uh, this uh, whole uh, capability of uh, offering that uh, as a service. Well, I'll jump in. I think that uh, value in our market. After a hundred years of viewing it in one particular way, shifting away from connectivity to real-time experiences, and the core as a as a SaaS is a portfolio asset to make what enterprises are willing to pay for happen, and that is to deliver rock-solid experience, digital resource availability, so that digital experiences are never compromised. And, and that is, it's, it's a platform for creativity, for innovation, for certainty, for growth, for enterprises and for service providers alike. Thank you so much. What an outstanding discussion we've had today. I'd like to thank all of our panelists from both Nokia and Omdia. And I'd like to invite the audience to complete our feedback form and explore our webpage for more information on Course Ask. Thanks for joining us today, and we will see you again at the next roundtable.